pass to Leitner. Puts it up. You're listening to the Culture State Podcast. Get ready. Woo. Three, two, one. Bust it. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Three, two, one. <clears throat> Bust it. <laughs> That's the way the podcast starts. Yes. Yeah, this is the Coach State Podcast. It, see, it wasn't supposed to start like that, but Dennis was, you know, went along with me. I was going to do uh, <laughs> the Noya clap, you know, kind of instrumental with my mouth, and uh, he just went on with the bus it. So <laughs> welcome to the Coach State Podcast. It's random as hell over here, but yeah, uh, thank is. you guys for listening. I'm Chris Lee. And I'm Dennis Cox. And uh, we have another great episode for you today. We are interviewing... Uh, a man that I have a lot of love for, and it's because he led my UNCG Spartans to the most successful stretch ever in school history. I'm mm-hmm. talking about Wes Miller. Not only that, Wes Miller is special to me outside of the fact that he coached my alma mater because uh, as somebody who covered him, he was all, always gracious with his time. He's the second head coach that we've had on this, current head coach that we've had on this show. Yeah. And he's not even in North Carolina anymore. This is how gracious he is uh, with his time. And we've had a few interactions that always went on my reels, which ultimately helped get me a new job at WRL. Uh, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's all Wes Miller. I mean, I had some work to do with that. But Wes Miller really helped out a lot uh, with a lot of that. So uh, I love having him on there. And I love the fact that now people outside of North Carolina Mm -hmm. get a chance to see how great he is. You know, a lot of people talk about when it comes to college basketball, especially March Madness, like, oh, who are these mid-major programs that could really make a run in the tournament or really make some noise potentially? UNC Greensboro was one of those schools over the last, like you said, about a decade or so where they were the team that was like, you don't want to mess with them. You better not, yeah. you know, better not just show up and expecting to win against UNCG because they'll, they'll put you down. And I, I was rooting hard for them back in the tournament for correctly. They played Florida state um, yeah. in the tournament and they gave them a run for their money. I get, you know, that's a Leonard a Hamilton. Shots, a couple yeah, shots. Exactly. Florida state is out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's the thing is that they were so close yeah. and he's got guys that are on that's on his team this past year um, that are, might find themselves on NBA rosters this coming fall. Yeah. I mean, just the news as we're recording this today, uh, Isaiah Miller mm-hmm. getting a tryout with the or not a tryout, but a workout with the Hornets before the draft. Yeah. You know, that's big. And you're talking about, you know, back in UNCG's history, maybe only a few people get those. Kyle Hines, you know, maybe a few others. But UNCG isn't known to kind of crank out uh, those guys that could potentially make NBA rosters. And here we have it. If, you know, not only could uh, somebody could potentially make an NBA roster, somebody could potentially get drafted. And it's all because um, Wes Miller saw something in him. Uh, Isaiah Miller wasn't somebody who was highly recruited out of Georgia. But then all of a sudden, Wes Miller goes to watch somebody else, sees Isaiah Miller, brings him to UNCG, only happens to be one of the best players in program history. Only happens to be one of the best players to ever come through to SoCon. The last person to win SoCon player of the year uh, two years in a row was Steph Curry. I've heard of him. I've heard of that his name, name rings too. a bell. Steph Curry. He, that he name rings a bell. Very familiar for some he reason. It does. It does. I, I think he had a brother, if I remember correctly. Uh, but he's here's from North the, Carolina. I he's might North be. Carolina. He oh might be from North Carolina. That's a good question. He had a father. I think he's a father named with last Dell. 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 Yeah, Dell Curry. That's right. That's a cool Curry dinky dink. Seriously. Now, <laughs> we always like to talk about in North Carolina basketball in the triangle as being the golden standard, right? State, Hoop Carolina, Hoop. Duke. They are the gold standard, but you venture out just, you know, hour and 15 minutes West North Carolina, a and UNC Greensboro. Those are two solid programs that are continuing to come up and up and up. So when you look at great basketball in the state of North Carolina, you don't have to just look in the triangle. You can go to the triad. Heck, even Appalachian State made it to the NCAA tournament. UNC Wilmington, even when, especially when Kevin Keats was there, had mm-hmm. some great teams. Davidson, when Steph Curry, Steph Curry was there. There are a lot of really good basketball teams in this state. And again, you <laughs> don't have to look in the triangle to find them. I would also throw in UNC Charlotte in there. I feel like yes. UNC Charlotte always has like sleeper talent. 
um, you know, they they haven't done a good job over the course of history of keeping that talent there uh, because it's almost like a feeder system. Somebody yeah. has a good year at UNC Charlotte. Next thing you know, they're at Wake Forest. So they can't really keep their their True. talent there. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of people uh, that uh, that from all over the state, man, East Carolina, we can throw them in there mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, Campbell had a had a pretty good year. You know, yeah. you talked about the triangle as well down the street from Duke, NC Central. Uh, yes, with Lavelle you can throw them in there. Yep. You know, it's uh, it, this is really this is really the hoop state, and outside of you know just the colleges, so many different um, conferences are coming to North Carolina to try to get the talent because they know that there's so much talent here that all the ACC schools are not going to get a chance to sign the good talent here. You yeah. know, you have somebody like a Jalen Cone who ended up having to go to, you know, Virginia Tech or, you know, now he's uh, at Northern Arizona, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that was like one of the best players in the state. These people are coming from all over the place. Uh, Aaron Wiggins from Greensboro uh, went to Maryland and now he's going to put himself in the NBA draft, you know, has a chance to get drafted. So um, he's definitely uh, Wes Miller is, is a part of that because I know that he knows the talent that's here and I'm pretty sure he's going to, still come back to recruit this area as well because he knows the talent that's there also went to carolina uh won a national championship with them so he knows uh great coaching he knows great basketball was under that roy williams learning tree and uh i'm excited to hear more from him and his journey at cincinnati now that he's there with the bear cats that is a major job for him for sure it, it is well let's not wait any further chris Wes miller right after this all right Back on the Culture State Podcast, Wes Miller, John Newman. I have to say this really quick before we start the actual interview. For the two days that John was supposed to come to UNCG, I was so excited. <laughs> and I was excited because, you know, I know John. I've been I'm covering him since high school. And he's been uh, really cool. And then uh, the idea of having John and Wes Miller together was very exciting for me. It's still going to happen. But this time it's going to happen in Ohio. But I'm still very much so excited for you guys. And this is a, a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity for you, Coach, huge opportunity for, for you, John. And uh, first off, I just want to open the floor for you both. And what's it like with these new surroundings? Uh, John, you wanted to you wanted to play for uh, Coach Wes Miller coming from Clemson. Mm -hmm. And um, you basically followed him. And then, uh, Wes, you're, you have the new big-time job. You absolutely deserve it. So what's it been like you guys coming in together and finally being able to work together? Well, first off, I you know want to apologize to John's family. for <laughs> They thought he was coming home <laughs> you know, uh, for his last two years of college basketball. Uh, and so I think I was thrilled. I, I'm like you, Chris. I watched John throughout high school, tried to recruit him a little bit. We, we knew that we weren't going to be able to get him at Greensboro. Um, but I've, I've watched him since he was a youngster and always admired the way that he not just played the game, but what he was about as a player, like the type of teammate he was, the type mm -hmm. of winner he was, and then certainly his ability. You know, and, and, I, and it was cool. I got to watch him, you know, all the way from Greensboro Day to CP3 and, 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 and everything in between. Um, and so when he was coming to Greensboro, I was thrilled. And then when, you know, I took the Cincinnati job, it just made a lot of sense, Chris. Like, I, it just made a lot of sense. I, I told John when I recruited him at Greensboro, he could play anywhere in the country. And at Greensboro, we were trying to compete with anywhere in the country. So there wasn't any type of job I would take that I wouldn't want to bring him with me. Hmm. How's it feel to be there with him, John? You finally get a chance to play for coach. Feel great, man. Feel great. I mean, you know, going with a guy I've known for a long time. And, you know, I, I know I can trust him. Um, and it's like kind of like over the years, we just kind of build that trust. Like I was, I remember, I always tell people like, I remember even when I was at Clemson, it's probably like my freshman, sophomore year, and I'd be in the gym working out. He was always like, man, whenever you want to come work out, like just let somebody, like let me know, you know what I'm saying? So he was always like, uh, he was always open with me and, uh, you know, I trust him. And I think through that process of, of the, us growing through time and him seeing, like him being around in Greensboro and me playing with his brother Walker and stuff like that, uh, the trust has been there. And so now it just feels, you know, I feel, I feel comfortable. Um, I feel I'm with somebody that's, that I'm comfortable with and I can trust. So it feels great. 
Now, I have a question. Now, in North Carolina, we have Eastern style barbecue versus Lexington style barbecue. And obviously, they have that stuff that's down there in South Carolina. But you're in Cincinnati now. The question is, is it Gold Star Chili or is it Skyline Chili? That's the big question that has to be settled while you're up in Cincinnati. <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't I haven't had I haven't had Gold Star yet. I heard Gold Star was fire, but you know, I, I hit Skyline. Skyline was pretty good. So I, I'm gonna have to see what's good with Gold Star a little bit, uh somewhere down the line. <laughs> uh I've I've had Skyline. Um Okay. It's 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 great. It, it's a it, it's not just great because it tastes good. It's an experience when you mm-hmm. you know, when you move to Cincinnati uh or you come to this town, you have to have Skyline. It's a, it's like a part of the community. And I haven't had Gold Star yet either, so I'm not going to comment there. But I've, I've, the Skyline thing's pretty cool. And people, the way people identify with it is even cooler. I've had Gold Star, so I will advocate for Gold Star Chili, though. So you, you have to let us know what you guys think of that. <laughs> we'll I need to go to Cincinnati to, to figure out what all this is about. <laughs> the, the, food, the food is great out here, Chris. I swear, it's, it's the best food I had in my life. Really? It's fire. Yeah, I've, right. I've gained 10 pounds since I got a coaching <laughs> job. You know, it's like part of that is not just the food. It's that I'm out at dinners and lunches all the time trying to yeah. feed everybody. But uh, the food's been great. There's some great restaurants. I'm, I'm a kind of a foodie at heart anyway. And and John and I have talked a lot about that. And, and listen, we both probably miss some of the food at home. Uh, no, no doubt about that. And we both have our spots in Greensboro that we're, we, we love and we're proud of. But I haven't been disappointed in what Cincinnati has to offer from a food perspective either. I I wanted to ask you, Wes, um, you know, I I know you had other opportunities uh, at UNCG. You did such a great job there. And as somebody who's an alum, I was definitely proud of the stretch because it was the best stretch of basketball ever at UNCG. And whatever is built from there, a lot of it, you know, has to do with what you uh, brought to the school. Uh, But why was this time? Uh, And and what about this opportunity made this the right opportunity, knowing that you had other opportunities in the past? Why was it time for you to to take this opportunity uh, at Cincinnati? Yeah, I was never like looking to leave UNCG. I, I was I wasn't anxious to leave at all. I was really invested in what we were doing. I, I thought there was still a lot of room for the program to grow. Um, I, I think Mike Jones has the opportunity to do that, and I think he's the right guy to do that. I, I think he'll continue to build upon where the program is now. Um, so I was never, you know, thinking I have to leave or I'm looking for a certain thing. But I always said if something that was truly special came along that moved me, and there were opportunities, there's no doubt about that, Chris. And, and my phone was ringing the last, you know, two or three years in the off season. Um, but it, it it was going to take something that truly moved me, and Cincinnati truly moved me. I mean, we're talking about one of the greatest programs in the history of college basketball. Uh, yeah. You know, place that's been to Final Fours and won national championships, and there's a passionate fan base. Uh, you know, like if you look at my background and, you know, growing up where I grew up, which you guys are familiar with, like playing in North Carolina and growing up in the heart of ACC basketball. Like I've always dreamed about coaching somewhere where it mattered like that because that's how I fell in love with the game. Mm -hmm. And Cincinnati basketball has that. It's 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 its own feel, right? It's its own unique identity up here. But the care and the love that people have for this program and the pride, it it, you you feel it the the minute you, you walk on this campus or walk around in the city, and so that really moved me. And so I thought the opportunity was just, just something I couldn't say no to. Do you feel added pressure being at a program like Cincinnati now? No, I wouldn't say added pressure. I I think I'd like to think that uh, nobody's mm-hmm. going to put more pressure on me than, than I'm going to put on myself. And, um, you know, so I, I felt an unbelievable amount of pressure to be great at UNCG, not because of where I was because of what I expected of our program and what I expected of our coaching, our staff and what I expected of myself as a coach. And I don't think that's going to change because we're in a new place. And then there's just, there's a more passionate fan base um, and there's bigger expectations. Uh, but, but I, I do have high standards and I think this program uh, it has high standards. And I think the people, whether it's the fan base or the alumni or the institution, or the athletic department, there's high standards and I'm, I'm okay with that. I've always wanted to be somewhere where that was expected. Well, so I want to ask you about recruiting and John, I want you to chime in on this as well, because, um, you know, you've, you've got John coming from Clemson and then also uh, you got my man, um, man, his name just slipped coming from Wake Forest. Odie. Odie. 
Odie Oguama uh, coming from Wake Forest as well. So you have some former ACC guys along with uh, just already the talent that's already at Cincinnati uh, and then others following you from, from UNCG. And, you know, over the last few years, you've been able to really get some talent that maybe ha- would have normally never come to UNCG to come to UNCG. Now you're at a, at a bigger place and you've done a masterful job putting together a team, I think, so far with what you have now. And then, um, you know, looking at what, you know, Isaiah Miller is doing today, you know, as we're recording this, he's getting to try it with uh, the, the Hornets or, or work out with the Hornets pre-draft. What is it about your recruiting style that you think draws people to you? And, John, I want you to just kind of piggyback on that about uh, Coach Miller. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about all, you know, try to analyze all that stuff, Chris, but, you know, what I do think is that we've, we've always really looked for, for guys that love basketball and are passionate about the game. We've looked for guys that are really competitive like ultra competitive between the lines. Uh, we, we've looked for guys that just have a high threshold for work that really believe in like the one day of time process of trying to get better. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we try to find young men and families that understand that as, as passionate as we are, as intense as we are about basketball, it's, it's much bigger than that. There's a greater responsibility when you're coaching college students to help them grow in all of the important areas of their life, of which basketball is only one of them, whether it's that's their school, uh, whether that's their social maturity, um, and, and a bunch of other things that go into it. And so we've been really specific about some of the things that we value, and we try to find people in recruiting that, that fit those values. And I think when there's alignment there, I, I think both sides feel it. That's what we're looking for. And we were really fortunate, especially in the last six or seven years at UNCG, that we, we got a better job at being honest about who we were and what we were looking for. And then I think the people that we were recruiting either vibed with that and were attracted to us or they didn't and they went somewhere else. And I think that led to some really neat things happening. But you mentioned Isaiah, you know, it wasn't just attracting guys that were highly recruited because early on at UNCG, I don't think we beat anybody for a recruit but it was attracting guys that were about what we're about. And then they improved over the course of their career because of the way they approached it. And you mentioned Isaiah, he was like the 40th ranked player in the state of Georgia. And now he's got a a realistic chance of playing in the NBA four years later. And that's kind of what we've been about and trying to find guys that are about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, To his points that he was saying, like, I agree. I think he does a really good job at, at finding guys that fit his mode and what he wants to see in the program. Uh, and I've seen that already. I, it's like my third week here, but I can just tell already. Like I was telling my dad, I'm like, man, like after workouts, everybody just hangs out. You know what I'm saying? In the gym and like everybody, like nobody really leaves. Everybody's either getting extra work in after practice or after workouts or or like people are just sitting down talking like about basketball and just being around the game. So he really um, I think that's, you know, he really lives. He re- He's really living that, you know, everybody's in the gym and he's created that environment and uh, recruited the kind of guys that, that want to stay around the game and, and talk about it and get get better. Um, so I think, you know, in that sense, you know, if you get if you can attract players that want to be around the game a lot, people are going to like naturally develop and, and get better. And I think that's why he's had so many guys in the past and um, and he's developed a lot of guys uh, from his school, like even James Dickey. Um, a lot of people don't know he's having a lot of success overseas. Yep. Um, and, and Isaiah Miller is obviously the big name. There are a lot of other guys that really paved the way. But, uh, you know, he just really f- finds those guys that 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 vibe, like he said, that vibe with what he wants in a program. And I think that's why he's had a lot of success. I, I do want to ask you, too, because, I mean, you both are, are competitors. And, uh, you know, Wes, you are you're definitely a, a competitor at uh, at UNC. And then, John, um, you know, I think it was uh, – January, early January of 2020, mm-hmm. when you at Clemson, you guys got the first win at Carolina ever. Oh, yeah. And and you have a relationship with Wes already. Were you in his text like saying, ah, I got you this time or anything like that? Was there any <laughs> riffing back and forth between you two like when it comes to that, knowing that you guys already had a, a relationship with each other? <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, it was no text. But I think I think he, he told me that he went back and watched it a couple of times. So he definitely, you know, I, He's feeling me. He's feeling me. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is this is true. When when 
John went in the portal um, at Clemson. We were still at Greensboro. You know, I, obviously, I know him as well as I know any player because of our, our history. And like, like, I mean, John mentioned he played with my brother, for yeah. gosh sakes, you know, and played for Coach Johnson and played for CP3. So I, I watched him forever since he was probably in seventh or eighth grade. Um, but I still went back and, and wanted to familiarize myself with what had happened to him at Clemson the last couple of years because I hadn't watched him in that sense at Clemson. And I did go back and watch the game at Carolina where they broke the streak. And I will say it moved me because, like, I remember, you know, people probably haven't talked a lot publicly about it, but, like, playing at Carolina, that game made me nervous. <laughs> like, you didn't want to be a part of the team that you lost. <laughs> you were aware of it. And if we were aware of it at Carolina, you know Clemson was a, players were aware of it, right? Yeah. John and I have had this conversation since he got up here, like, and or when we were recruiting him. Um, so to see him perform like that, you know, in that kind of a moment on that stage with, with all the pressure, uh, that, that goes into the 50, like, was it 50 sometimes, John? It was 59. It was 59, 59 times that they've been <laughs> unsuccessful. Um, you know, that was pretty neat for him to have one of the best games of his career in that kind of moment with all that hoopla around it. Um, then now going back to my Carolina roots, I wasn't necessarily happy with the result. Right. Uh, but I was happy <laughs> yeah. that the guy I was recruiting was a big part of, of why, you know, Clemson broke that streak. That's pretty neat. John, what was the feeling like when you guys did win that game? What was the feeling like for you and for and for the team? It was crazy. It was like it, it was like for real. When the buzzer went off, everything was like a blur. You know what I'm saying? It was it was crazy, <laughs> man. Cause like we knew we had made history and something about that game, like because they were beating us really the whole game, I think. I think they were beating us the whole game. We came back. We were down 11 with, like, like two and a half minutes left. Mm -hmm. So everything was just, like, happening so fast. And then when that clock went off, it was like we, like, were free. Like, they just threw the chains off. <laughs> and we was like, oh, my God, like, we finally did it. You know what I'm saying? So it was, it was, you know, it was like a weight lifted off our shoulders almost. So, so what's funny about that night, um, so it was my anniversary night with my wife. We actually already knew I was coming to WRAL. I don't know if it was announced by then yet or not, but we decided to spend the weekend in Raleigh so we could drive around look, looking for, for homes or whatever. And I kept up with the score on my phone or whatever, because, you know, especially people that I've, I've covered in high school uh, who are in high school now in college, always try to you know look back and see what they're doing. And so I wanted to see how John was doing. And so I was just going back and forth on my phone. And then I think I was out at dinner and then the butt, uh, I get the, a notification that goes off on my phone. I'm like, whoa, they did it. And my wife's like, what were you talking about? <laughs> and it wasn't like necessarily like an anti-Carolina thing, but I was happy for John that he, that he, that he was a part of that team and was able to, to do that. And, uh, and you're right, coach, like the, the competitiveness that I've seen. Um, I brag on John all the time. I saw him in a pickup game against uh, Brandon Childers and Bam Adebayo and a bunch of other guys who were a lot older than him at the time. And he held his own and actually, to me, shined in that uh, amongst all those other people, you know. And so it was always kind of cool to see that. And I know he's going to bring a lot to Cincinnati. Uh, what is it? What about this group that you have right now in Cincinnati uh, that makes you, um, you know, confident in what you guys can do uh, this upcoming season uh, as you guys get prepared for uh, this uh, this first season for you? Well, you know, we're, we're just getting started, but I, I do feel good about what we have and what we're doing. Um, you know, the first thing is it all starts with people. You know, we're in a, we're in a people business, and you want to have the right kind of people, the, the kind of people that you want to walk in and see every day and spend time with. It's a, College basketball is really intimate, and we spend, we spend more time with each other, and, and John knows this after his three years, than we spend with anybody else in our lives. Yeah. And it's it now the, with the the way things are structured, it's almost all year round. Um, so you want to really enjoy the people you're around. I, I'm enjoying this group. Like I, it's going to be fun to be around this group every day. That gets me excited. And, and it's not just I'm enjoying them. I think everybody's enjoying each other. Um, and and I think that wins over time. I really do. Uh, I think we have a a really unique blend of uh, experience and youth. You know, I think you have to have experience now in college basketball for the most part. And we have some guys that have multiple years of college <laughs> basketball experience under their belt and have had success. Um, like, John, like John is sitting here. I mean, he's played three years uh, in the ACC. He's been on NCAA tournament teams. He's had personal success. 
Uh, we, we have a number of other guys like that, like Abdul Otto from Mississippi State. He's got the most starts in the history of Mississippi State basketball. You know, like Hayden and Jared and AJ got to experience the NCAA tournament at UNCG last year. ODS two years of college basketball under his belt at Wake Forest. Those are the guys coming in. The guys that have been in this program have been through quite a bit the last couple of years, but a couple of them were a part of the team that, that won the conference tournament two years ago and would have gone to the NCAA tournament if it wasn't for the pandemic. And then we got some young guys that were just here for a year, and they've been through quite a bit, but they're talented and they're hungry. So I, I think we have a really good mix of like youth and experience, and we do have some guys that understand what this, what this takes. And then finally, I think we got some depth. Like I, I think we're going to be able to – to get into our bench a little bit and play multiple guys and all the success that we've had in the 10 years I've been a head coach, we, we, we've had deep teams. We, we've never done it mm-hmm. with five or six guys and the style that we play, you have to be able to play into your bench. And so I, I think we do have some depth and we're going to be able to play multiple <laughs> guys this year. All right. My final question that I have for, for both of you is obviously you you're in Cincinnati now, but you're from, North Carolina from the three, three, six, what makes Greensboro the area special, but also what's the state of North Carolina? What makes it so special? John, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, I think what makes Greensboro special is like people. So I would, I was, when I was at Clemson, I was always like bragging on like Greensboro and where I was from, because like it's a place you can have pride in, but it was like, we had went there for the ACC tournament. And everybody was like, what's there to do? Like, what's around? I'm like, uh, I mean, it's a couple of things to do, but it, it, that's not really what makes it special. Like what it makes Greensboro special to me is the, is the people there, like the people that you're going to meet. Uh, like you'll, you'll really develop like real genuine relationships with like, I feel like in Greensboro, you could start a conversation with somebody you don't know on the side of the street and like, it would be genuine. And um, a lot of the experiences I've had and, you know, I've been there my whole life pretty much. And, you know, I've just met some of the, some of the greatest people, and they've been real good to me, supporting me through everything. Um, so I think what I think what makes it special is the people, and, and it's it's very unique. Um, it's like a lot of different, a lot of different kinds of people there. Like it's like really a melting pot. I think it was uh, after one of the wars, a lot of a lot of people from uh, the Asian community came to Greensboro because it was like a city where I think it was like almost like a, considered like a safe haven. Um, mm-hmm. It's real progressive, so. It's just like a melting pot, uh, a lot of good people. And um, it's like, you know, we got our own little culture. You know, I don't know. It's different. It's different from a lot of places, but we got our own little swag. Yeah, I, I agree with John. It's uh, the community, the warmth. That's what I think about. Um, there, there's a pride in being from Greensboro and being a part of that community. And, and that's it. there's some parallels between what I've been feeling in Cincinnati in Greensboro, even though they're very different in a lot of ways, and this is a major city, there's a ton of pride and warmth here as well. Um, but the, the, that, that's that's what I think about when I think about home. It's just the community, the people, the warmth. And then I think it's so interesting, you know, being there professionally for the last you know, 12, 13 years, you know, watching like John's group, not just John, but all those guys his, his age, Yep. And some, some a little older, some a little younger, but all those players that you saw when they were 10 years old, a lot of them came to my camps in the summer, you know. So I, I saw a ton of those kids since they were really young all the way through. And they've always I know, all stuck together no matter where they went to college. They've all There's a real pride in being a basketball player from Greensboro that I've seen in the last 15 years, you know, as I've been in coaching. And I think that's really neat. It, it, UNCG, it was cool because all those guys would come home in the summer from their colleges and they would come to UNCG to play pickup. So I get to see that connection up close and center um, and that they all pull for each other. They all stay in contact after college. Uh, I think I wish I could go back and play basketball again and go home in Greensboro now because you can always find a great pickup game in Greensboro in the summertime because all the guys come back and they all communicate and get together. And again, fortunately, at UNCG, we, we kind of had that as our home base. So we got to kind of witness some of it. But uh, but no, it's a special place. It'll always be home to me. And and you know, listen, I'm thrilled to be in Cincinnati, and I'm proud to be in Cincinnati and fully embracing this. But uh, of course, I'll, I'll I'll miss Greensboro, miss home. There's no doubt about that. To piggyback off of what you guys were saying, because um, there's a lot of truth there. One of the things that uh, really uh, impressed me was when the tornado came through Greensboro, and I was in contact with uh, John that day or the day after. And because he and a bunch of other guys 
um, got together and, you know, did a drive and was trying to help out. And, you know, they they put everything down. It wasn't about, you know, anything else. They got together and uh, did the drive. And that really impressed me about that community of basketball players. So you're right. It is it really is about the the community there. And, um, you know, it's about the people. Um, I do want to ask you while we have you, Wes. Um, you know, the other coaching change that uh, you were rumored for that a lot of people saw saw you as a potential replacement for Roy Williams after he retired. Uh, Hubert Davis got the job. Uh, but I want to know uh, what's your thoughts about, you know, of course, Coach Williams, what he's meant to you in, in your life and your growth as a coach. And then also, how do you feel about uh, Hubert and, and the way that uh, he'll take over uh, the Carolina program? Uh, since you're an alum uh, from the school and won a national championship there as well. Yeah, well, first off with Coach, I miss him. You know, not not that he's gone, but when we hit the road recruiting uh, the last three of the last four weekends, we've been on the road recruiting for the first time in, you know, a year, you know, a couple of years, right, because we missed last summer due to the pandemic. And I always loved going recruiting since I got into this profession because I'd bump into Coach and I'd be able to sit with him and visit with him you know, every once in a while, I got to hop on, I'll hop on his plane for a ride. You know, <laughs> at Greensboro, we never got to travel the way he traveled during recruiting. So sometimes I'd get a ride. Um, <laughs> but but I'm only being I, that happened. I'm only saying that in a funny way. But I, yeah. I, I'm, I miss him. I miss, you know, it was so neat to have be in coaching and have my college coach and my mentor actually coaching as well. You know, and, and I'd like to think I didn't take it for granted, but it's definitely different. So I, I miss him, and this profession is going to miss him. North Carolina basketball is going to miss him. There's no doubt about that. We're talking about one of the giants in the history of our sport and our game. Um, and sometimes I've had to pinch myself and go, hey, the guy that I can call on speed dial to ask for advice, not just about basketball, about life, that guy just happens to be a Hall of Famer, maybe one of the best that's ever done, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah the best that's ever done it in the college game. Um, so I, like to, to talk about what it means him stepping down, I don't think I have the ability to articulate that because it just, it, it's such a big thing. Um, in terms of Hubert, I, you know, uh, I think the, the Carolina family is so well documented. Uh, it's very real. You know, people always ask, is it real? It's, it's more than real. And the more that you go other places, you find out how special it is. Um, and you know, for that job to stay within the family, uh, I think anybody that played there wanted to see that, uh, Hubert Davis will do a phenomenal job. I, uh, I didn't play for Hubert, but I got to know him really well in 2005, 2006, my junior year, we were short on bodies and he was retired at that point, but practice with us a lot of that year. So I kind of feel like I got to spend a little bit of a season with him because him and King Rice were helping us out in practice on the scout team and he could still really play in those days. <laughs> yeah. He was a little slower probably than he was when he was playing in the NBA, he could still play. Uh, and since that time of getting to know him personally, I've just thought the world of him as a man, uh, as a, as a, as a father, as a husband, he has a tremendous faith. Uh, my brother played for him the last, you know, as his assistant the last four years. And I know he was great to Walker and help Walker on and off the court in, trem- in tremendous ways. And I've, I've been able to listen to, Walker talk about that over the years. So I have great respect for Hubert as, as a person, as a man, as a coach. And I'm, I'm proud that as an alum and former player that, that he's representing Carolina basketball. So I, I think he'll do a tremendous job. Uh, but but no, make no mistake about it, and, and I don't mean this towards anybody, I, I just miss Coach Williams because that's my college coach, and I miss seeing him out there on the road, and, and, and I miss seeing him on TV and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you both for for joining us uh, for for this podcast here with uh, WRL, and uh, it's, it's cool to talk to you on this platform. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've you've meant so much to me at, at WXI as well. I wanted to also uh, talk to you guys here, both of you uh, guys here. And uh, Dennis, we might as well call this the three three six episode. So, I mean, might as well. I mean, yeah, you, Chris loves to brag about the three three six, so I'm going to go ahead all and the time. This one. For sure. Okay. He's he's probably heard so many annoying stories that I've had about guys like you or just whoever else you know I've, that's been there and I've covered. But I'm always bringing somebody up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny did this. Well, I'm always like, this. <laughs> yeah, he's always he, doing it. Always <laughs> he doing probably it. hates that. <laughs> the, the, the three three six is doing pretty good, guys. The, you know, uh, last time I checked, a guy from the three three six looks like in you know we're coupling in Winston High Point. 
and yeah. all that. But a guy from the three three six looks like he might be ready to win a ring here yeah. in the next, in the next week yep. or so. so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In terms of basketball, the three three six has done pretty darn good, and this one this one on the podcast right here is going to do really good for us here at Cincinnati. Absolutely. Shout out to CP3. Hopefully he gets that, that ring as well. So Amen. thank you both for, uh, for, for joining us and uh, good luck to you at Cincinnati. We'll definitely be watching close. And uh, of course, you know, if you guys slide down to East Carolina for a couple games, I know you will. It should be on your schedule. I'll make sure I try to get out there and see you guys. Yeah, come see us. For sure, man. Appreciate you. Man, I just feel good, man. I feel like I just took a little quick trip home. I went down well- I-40. Yeah, I have no doubt. While while John and Wes were talking about the three three six, yeah, you're sitting there looking all stoic inside. I know you're like, yeah, let's yeah, go. Of course, three three six. Let's and, go. And you know, Regional for Bettises, let's go. <laughs> I stole that line from Chris, by the way. Yeah, that's that was my little rap line that um, mm-hmm. I was going to try to debut at some point. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm so three three six, like three Jerome Bettises. Anyway, that might go over some people's heads. Um, I'm so proud of both of those guys, John mm-hmm. Newman. Uh, has been a, a wonderful player at Clemson. I think he was gonna, he's going to get more of a chance to shine at Cincinnati. Sure. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've already known that West has been amazing in our area as a head coach, and uh, more people will get a chance to see it in the AAC uh, with him at Cincinnati. Cincinnati is going to do well. Cincinnati is going to make the NCAA tournament this mm-hmm. upcoming season. I'm just going to go ahead and call it. They're going to make the NCAA tournament, and uh, they're going to make some noise for sure. It, one thing that I'll, with Wes Miller, he's been around for so long. He's still only 38 years old. You know, I look at him yeah. like, dang, I just turned 35. He's only three, you know, three years older than me. And like, and here he yeah. is just climbing the ranks. He's done so much early in his life and then early in his coaching career. I mean, sky's the limit for him. The sky's the absolute limit for him in his coaching career. Absolutely. Um, he's going to do well. And, Um, just like I said in the show there, um, being able to snag, being a first time, not a first time head coach, but a first time, um, major head coach at a major program like Cincinnati Mm -hmm. and to be able to get two ACC guys, uh, Odie Oguama and, um, and John Newman, two guys who are going to play really, really hard defense for you guys who are going to really play hard for you and the other, you know, getting somebody from the SEC, and uh, bringing some guys from UNCG with you, and getting a lot of the guys at Cincinnati to stay. Yeah, he could have lost the the entire team with the way the transfer portal is now. Mm-hmm. He got many of the guys to stay. That shows a lot with who he is. Um, you know, the folks in our area, you may be familiar with John Newman, of course, with you know his time at Clemson. Thing that we didn't mention is that same week that Carolina uh, lost to Clemson. I think Clemson beat NC State and Duke like within two weeks of that. Yeah. So they, they beat all three triangle teams like within two yeah. weeks of, of that that happening uh, at the Dean Smith Center. Yeah, they had they had, that Clemson team had themselves a little bit of a run there against yeah. the triangle schools. It's like, wait a second, three three triangle schools should not be losing to Clemson. Uh, that was here's, a big talk for a while. Here's something that, that we didn't bring up, though, that I mm-hmm. felt bad. That's 2020. So that Clemson team did very good. They also beat Florida State. Yeah, it was gonna. It was March twelfth, my eighth day at WRAO, at the Greensboro Coliseum in the ACC tournament, where at noon it was supposed to be Florida State and Clemson. Florida State's yeah. number one seed. Clemson already had beaten Florida State earlier that year. Actually, mm-hmm. I want to say like two weeks before that. Um, yeah. And so you know, I was on the floor, and I'm looking at John watch Florida State get that trophy, being named ACC champions without playing a game, knowing that they just beat this team and they had they were about to get a chance to try to play them before everything was called. And I had a chance to talk with him, the disappointment on his face, and but it was also like there was determination on his face. So I know that John is going to do an amazing job at Cincinnati. Uh, you know, went through an interesting time at, at Clemson with, with that particular situation happening. Uh, but that guy is going to show you uh, how good he really is at, at Cincinnati for sure. Uh, speaking of Cincinnati, Chris, I'm surprised you are. Can you eat chili? I mean, you're a vegan. Are you allowed to eat chili, or is it mostly I mean, just tomato vegan, sauce and beans? If it's if it's made, you know, in a vegan way, like you know, beans, of course, is good. If maybe yeah. if they use um, instead of meat, you know, some Beyond Beef or something like that, you know, I'd probably eat it. Okay, yeah. so mostly just tomato sauce and beans this is what you're allowed to have. And Beyond Beef, yeah. 
I mean, Which that's basically most, beans. I put it put it into this. Most of the ingredients I can eat. Most of them. There's one mm-hmm. ingredient that I won't eat, which is the meat part of it. Okay, because I mean, you, you, everything you else is left... what makes the flavor. The, the meat doesn't <laughs> I mean, have the flavor. I mean, you kind of you kind of felt you know left out on the whole Gold Star uh, you know mm-hmm. Skyline chili conversation. I was like, well, I'm surprised Chris can even have chili because there's meat in it. So you probably can't even have Gold Star Skyline. I'm just saying, Chris. Well, if they're with the times, hopefully they have uh, you know a vegan option. Doubt it. I mean, a, a lot of some restaurants don't, but the restaurants who are with yeah. the times, mm-hmm. they have these vegan options now. So shout outs to those places who are with the times, who are with the times for all you people with the times. Chris <laughs> loves you. People that don't want to, you know, eat dead corpses, you know, shout outs to y'all. Wow. Now I, feel, <laughs> now, I feel, now I feel judged once again for my life decisions. I feel judged by Chris Lee for my life choices. <laughs> Ah, uh, no judgment here, man. I used to be one of those people. We all come around whenever we come around. So, you know, I can't I can't judge. I used to be there with you. If you would have met me like six years ago, we'd enjoy some uh, chicken wings together for sure. Now I want wings. Thank you, Chris. Now I want wings. <laughs> now I'm going to eat them and they're going to taste so good. I'm going to feel a moment of guilt and then be like, hey, you know what? These wings are too good. I'm not going to feel guilty anymore. I can sorry, put together Chris. like some fried cauliflower wings for you. And you know, batter those up for you. You down with that? Put some buffalo sauce on them. <clears throat> oh, you're gonna go radio silent on me? Is this how is this how we gonna do it right now? Follow us wherever you get your podcast, <laughs> Apple, it's Spotify, like it's a dead corpse or something. Com. <laughs> it's not like it's a rotting piece of meat, it's cauliflower. You can also follow us on Instagram <laughs> and Twitter at culture state pod. You can also follow me at the fam rookie. It's not like it wasn't a living being with feelings or something. You can follow me at Chris Lee TV. And that's L E A. Yes. I'm a living person with feelings and animals were living beings with feelings. Thank you guys for listening to the culture state podcast. We really appreciate it. Culture state radio coming very, very soon. Stay Get tuned, me on folks. the lookout. We will give you some really good information about that very, very soon. Thank you for listening. Go see me shake. <laughs> we out. The Culture State Podcast, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network, with new shows coming out every Wednesday. Download and subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts, including the WREL Sports Fan app.